Let's pray. Father, we humble our hearts before you today. We thank you, Jesus, that you love people. You love the lost and the broken and the widow and the orphan and the drug addict, Lord. You love them. And I pray today that this message would help us to understand our calling as believers, as people that love you and say that they love you. Lord, help us to do your work. Lord, touch this place today with your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew 9, verse 35, if you have your Bible. Today we're going to talk about the reaching people part of our vision, and I've titled this Reaching People with Good News. Uh, You and I, if you are a Christian, you have Jesus living on the inside of you, by the way. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And you are full, I want you to hear this, please hear this. You are full of the kingdom of God. When, G, when, when John uh, asked about Jesus, uh, one of his disciples said, hey, are you the one? Or are we supposed to wait for another one? And John sa- uh, Jesus said, tell John that demons are cast out, the, 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 the dead are raised, the sick are healed, and the, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then Jesus said to all of us, the reason why he came and he died and the the Holy Spirit empowered us, that same anointing is on every believer that's in this room. And some people argue about that. No, 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 that's not true. That is true. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. We are packing, if you will, the kingdom of God, Jesus, inside of us. We can bring good news. We can bring a smile. We can bring joy. We can bring money. We can bring blessing. Today, how many of you are going out to uh, lunch today? Oh, come on. I know there's more than that. You're lying. (laughs) Hey, be kind to your waiter and waitress, your server. Bless them with just the kindness of God. It makes a difference. People say to me all the time, man, there's something different about you. I go, yeah, I was dropped on my head a couple times as a kid. And they go, no, 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 no. (laughs) And I say, "Ah, it's probably just your sense in the, the Lord, the love of God, the kindness of God. So be Jesus when you go out today. Amen. Matthew 9, verse 35, Jesus traveled through all the cities and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news, underline that in your Bible, about the kingdom. And wherever he went, he healed people of every sort of disease and illness. He felt great pity on the crowds that came because their problems were so great. Kind of sounds like America, huh? And they didn't know where to go for help. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest is so great, but the workers are so few. So pray the Lord who was in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send out more workers into his field. I told you the story. When I was a kid, we had um, an orchard that had like almonds and apples and all kinds of fruit. And my dad would say at certain times of the year, go out there and start picking some fruit. And when you're 12 and it's 100 degrees outside, you're like, I don't want to go pick fruit. And he goes, son, if we don't go pick the fruit, that fruit is going to, the weather's going to destroy it and it's going to fall to the ground and it will be useless. And one time I was reading the scripture and I felt like the Lord spoke this to my heart. He said, son, the harvest is not self-reaping, but it is self-destructive. It is self-destructive. In other words, if you and I don't go out with the good news and start bringing people into the kingdom, the fruit actually is self-destructive. And we see that. People that don't know Jesus, man, we hear about it four times this week. Somebody shot so-and-so. Somebody stabbed so-and-so. All these crazy things are going on. And I'm telling you right now, the trouble, I think, in the world, yes, there's evil, but, but the Bible says that we're to overcome evil with good. And sometimes I wonder if it's because the body of Christ is asleep in the light. We're not out being Jesus to people. And so, for instance, a a person struggling and troubled, and 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 we as Christians kind of go, oh, they're kind of weird and freaky. And we pass them by instead of saying, hey, can I pray for you? When you see somebody that's sick, you know, sniveling. My mom was the best, man. She she was... um, I, she embarrassed me. Can we just say it? When I was a little kid, she embarrassed me sometimes. But she would see people at the store or wherever, and she'd go, honey, come here. It's a stranger. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching my mom, and she's like, what's going on with you today? Putting her on. And I'm like, mom, you don't know that lady. <laughs> and the person says, well, I'm having a hard day. And my mom says, well, let's pray. Do you know that most people won't turn prayer down? And my mom would just pray, Lord, and the person starts to cry. And I think that's the kingdom right there. It just came into Safeway and touched a life. And it wasn't weird and it wasn't freaky. 
We have the opportunity as East Bay Fellowship in Africa and in Danville to extend the kingdom of God and to bless people's lives. And today it's easy. We're going to ask you all to give $35 a month to Atenawa. None of it stays here. Not a dime. But it goes to, to, to children that are waiting in line to go to school, to help build a building, to buy medicine. You and I take it for granted. I live right by CVS. Guess what, guess what happens to me when I don't feel good? I just get out of my house and I go over to CVS and I look for, oh, there's an Advil with this and then there's a Snickers bar. You know, you got to get that too while you're at it. There's some of those little red fish. What are they called? Swedish fish. Oh my gosh. They're like, it's crack for a Christian. <laughs> I, just go, I just go buy what I need. And then I forget that there's people on the other side of the world that when they're sick and troubled, they don't have anything. And I'm thinking, Lord, who am I? I'm so selfish. By the way, guys, we live in a culture in America where we can become so self-absorbed. And, and, and we get so insulated. And we just, our troubles, oh, poor. And listen, I'm not saying we don't have troubles. We all have troubles. But we don't have troubles like the kids over there, and they didn't put it on the video, who had to murder their parents. Because the, the, the what was the name of Resistance Army came in and took them and said, hey, shoot your mom and dad right now, or you die. And we're like, oh, I didn't get an increase on my visa card. What was me? <laughs> and I know we have real troubles and problems, but it kind of puts your life into perspective. When you start looking at somebody else's problem, it kind of helps you think about your problem as not being so great. A pastor told me one time, he, I was, you know, in high school, and I was down on myself, and ooh, woe is me. And this great pastor said to me, Rick, you know what you need to do? You need to find somebody that has a greater problem than you do and go serve them. So what are you talking about? He said, go find somebody and serve them and get your mind off of you. I was just in a conversation with someone last week and they were feeling down about themselves and I said, here's the problem. We all should have a healthy look at who we are and that we're not that great and all this stuff and we have brokenness. But if you look too long down into the rabbit hole of your own soul, you'll get lost there. And even worship today, and I, I love new worship songs, but some of our worship that's today, it's, we sing so much about ourselves. You ever notice that? And some of it's not good. It's like, and look, I know that, you know, David said, woe is me, and then he ended up praising God. But some of our worship songs are like, I'm a puke, I'm a goober. And I'm like, wait a second, that's true. But I want to sing to the Lord the truth about who he is and who I am in him. And stop looking into myself so much. And start looking at the Lord and saying, Lord, you're righteous. You're good. You're the one, yeah, I know I'm a messed up person. The enemy whispers to your soul, you're a jerk, you're not very good, you're not a very good Christian. And you go, yeah, Lord, forgive me for that, but oh, I want to look at the beauty of the Lord. I want to focus right now on how good you are and how awesome you are and watch my problems start to diminish because I find myself in Christ. And when there's something, you're going through a hard time, I double dog dare you, find somebody that has a problem bigger than you and go serve that person and go love that person. And let's get our heads out of our own life to where we just get insulated by trouble. Listen, what I'm going to give you three, three, three quick things about Jesus that I love. Luke 19.10 says that the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was his mission. Anybody ever lost? My son just went down. I was so proud of him. He said, Dad, I want to go to San Francisco tonight with a couple of people in the church. I said, for what? We're going to go serve homeless people until like 1 in the morning. It wasn't quite one, but it was close, 11. I, and you know what I instantly did? I instantly was like, oh, my gosh. My 13-year-old down there, he said, Dad, it was weird. Because he went, Dad, it was weird. People were talking to poles and all kinds of stuff. It was crazy. And I go, honey, I remember when I was your age, and, or a little older than you, and our youth pastor said, we need to go to the world and touch people for Jesus. We need to go preach the gospel. Hippie, two other hippie friends of mine, went to our youth pastor afterwards and said, let's do it. Let's go, pastor. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, man, the streets are full of young people tonight. It's Friday night. There's hundreds and hundreds of kids partying. Let's go and preach the gospel to them. And he went like this. Oh, well, I'll take you guys, and I'll drop you off in the church van. So there I go in the church van. Eh, I'm in the back of the church van. We're praying, and he opens the door at Safeway. We jump out, and he, he peels out of there. And man, we started talking to people about Jesus on the streets. And I was telling my son, son, that's what I used to do. I used to go to the streets and tell people about Jesus. It was, it's awesome. 
And I said, yeah, I'm so proud of you, honey, because we live in a society where we can easily become so self-consumed, and I love your heart that you want to go out and help people that are having trouble because Jesus went about doing good, the Bible says. And Jesus came to set the captive free. And so I love that you're doing that. Listen to Acts 10.38, write it down. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. When I read that verse the first time as a young man, I said, Jesus, I want that. I want to be anointed by the Holy Spirit with power. I want to go to the oppressed. I want to go to people that are broken with the good news of Jesus Christ. I've told you this story. I'm going to tell it again. And somebody said, do you tell the same stories a lot? Yes, deal with it. <laughs> Brand new Christian, six weeks old, eight weeks old in the Lord, and I got to school. It was probably, you know, school started in early uh, August, so this was probably in October sometimes. I'd just gotten saved. And me and my hippie buddy that got saved after me, we found out one of our friends was sick. And he was bad fever. People said he was really bad, going to have to go to the hospital. And <laughs> so we show up at his front door. He's a block away from the school. And we show up. <coughs> Mom opens the door, and there we are. And we partied with this guy a few months before that. We smoked pot with him. And he was a guitar player in a band I was in. And so his mom's standing there going, hey, we hear Tom's sick. And she goes, yeah, 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 he's sick. We're here to pray for him. She was like, what? See, she was more freaked out about us praying for him than she was about smoking pot with him. I'm not kidding. She was freaked out. And we said, I just stepped, I just kind of pushed her aside and we walked in. <laughs> My buddy is laying there on the bed completely out. I mean, just like green. You know that when you're sick, green? And he wasn't even awake. And so I bent down by his feet and I grabbed onto his feet. And my other friend stood up by his head and I knelt down. And all I said was this, because I'd read it in the Bible. Jesus, you said if we believed in you, we'd lay hands on the sick and they would recover. That's all I said. And then I said, God, touch my friend in the name of Jesus. And I'm not joking. He shot up out of his bed. He didn't go, oh, what's going on? He literally jumped up, standing on his bed, and said, what was that? <laughs> Fever gone. See, I was young enough in the Lord to where I had read that verse that we could go and do things for Jesus. No one had exegeted the power out of the Bible yet for me. The Greek expert, well, the Greek, the Greek, and this and that, and really this is for then and not for now, and blah, 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 blah. I had read it enough so there was just strong faith in my heart that was crisp, and I just said, we can do anything the Lord asks us to do. Demon possessed, boom, let's cast the demon out of him. Man, let's do it. And see, the church has gotten cooled down, and Jesus went about doing good, and we, we hunker down. Oh, man, it's a scary world. And Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. By the way, I have to read that verse all the time. How about you? Because the world's going crazy. A few weeks ago when I said that our government has lost its mind, some people came up to me and said, are, are you talking about Barack Obama? I said, no, I'm talking about all of them. <laughs> not Republican, not Democrat. Our, our, our governments have, have lost their way. And by the way, the Bible says that before the end comes, that there would be a one world currency in the government, that there would be all kinds of things going on. So it's going to fall apart. Do you hear me? Look right here. It's going to fall apart because Jesus said it's going to fall apart. Now, we can sign the petitions that, you know, come on, listen, showering, honestly, when I was 15 years old, if that law would have been passed, well, if you feel like a girl today, you can go in the girl's locker room. <laughs> I feel like a girl. I feel like a girl. Come on, it's a pathetic thing. It's going to cause so much trouble. That's what I'm talking about. Guys, listen. We have the good news in us. We don't have to be critical. We don't have to go after people. We don't have to, hey, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. That's the bad news. Everyone knows the bad news. I used to go up to people on the streets and say, you're going to hell. Do you know that? That was my opening remarks. <laughs> Just want to talk to you about your life. And they're like, sweet. You're going to hell. <laughs> you listen to Ozzy Osbourne. Look at you. Look, you're smoking. Just smoking doesn't send someone to hell. Look right here. The kind of music people listen to doesn't send them to hell. What sends people to hell is that they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
That's what sends someone to hell. So after terrorism evangelism didn't work, <laughs> I realized, I read there, the good news of Jesus. It's not the bad news of Jesus Christ. It's the good news. And you and I are packing that news in our hearts, on our expressions. I uh, got to confess sin again to you. Every week it seems like I'm doing it. I was driving by myself to go over to Antioch to go to jury duty. How many want to go to jury duty? <laughs> I'm looking at this guy next to me going, that guy could determine if someone goes to prison? That's scary. You know what I mean? It's just a crazy, crazy world. And I was driving and somebody kind of got in front of me and I was in full mode. You know what I mean? I was in 80 mile an hour mode. I call that LA mode. And, I, and the person cut me off. And they looked in their mirror at me. And this is what they saw from Pastor Rick. <laughs> Both hands off the steering wheel, right? And when I passed him, I gave him the look. You know the look. <laughs> and then as I got around him, and I made sure that when I got around him, I made it kind of close. You know that thing? <laughs> Soon as I did it, the Holy Spirit of God just went, what are you doing? Are you joking right now? What did that person do to you? Well, they, Lord, I was in full flow, and they cut me off. How about some kindness, son? How about this in the mirror? <laughs> well, Lord, you're going to have to help me with that one, because I'm not very good at that. You know what I mean? And Jesus went about doing good. Romans 12, 21 says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I'm not talking about just walking old ladies across the street. That's good. I'm talking about what it says about Jesus, that he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he went around doing good. And watch this, breaking off of people the oppression of the devil. And you can do that with a smile. You can do that with a, how you doing today? Taking, actually caring about somebody besides yourself. I'm the same way. Listen, I'm preaching to myself today. This finger's coming this way. I actually like taking time to look at somebody and go, you doing all right today? Instead of being impatient with them. Hurry up. You ever been in the line at the store and you get in the wrong line at the store? You, you, do you do it? Do you get your, your buggy, your little cart, and you're coming across and you look, you actually look at the lines and go, not a good line. That lady has 700 items. I'm going to go to, oh, here's the one. Guy has three items. This will take two seconds. I pull in behind. And then he starts asking questions about stuff and the do and the ba da 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 and you're just standing there going, really? <laughs> and instead of being that impatient person that we are, I actually just moved my card up and I just stood by him. <laughs> I, just, I just stood by him. And then the guy, hey, sorry, man, about this. So you're trying to, like, it's cool, bro, it's all good. How's your day going? Well, you know, I've been having troubles. Well, what's your troubles, man? Tell me about your troubles. Well, my wife. Oh, I'm like, say no more. You know, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm totally kidding. I love you, baby. I just got to get her every now and again with us. But listen, I just, there's just kindness there. It's so simple. The kingdom can come in Safeway. Boom. And it's, but most of the time, we're not thinking about the kingdom. We're thinking about what we have to get finished and what we have to get accomplished, what we have to get done. Yeah? Let's stop doing that. Just recognize that we're full of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me read you uh, one of my favorite verses or chunks in the Bible, Luke chapter 15, verse 1. I've read this to you before. This is going to be by way of review, and I just because I want you to remember it. Tax collectors, listen to this. I love this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. That is awesome. There were people that were so bad at sinning, they were like notorious. They had like, like a plaque or something. I don't know. Often came to listen to Jesus teach. I go, wow, Jesus, you must have been amazing. Because people followed you wherever you went. Notorious sinners wanted to hear what you had to say about stuff. Because he didn't say it in a judgmental way like sometimes I can get and sometimes you can get. Or we're a little bit self-righteous and we actually think we got it going on more than we probably do. And we start downing people that don't look like us and don't act like us. And we start pointing the finger. Have you ever, ever once done that in your life? I have, and the Lord corrects me so fast. 
He goes, you remember when you had long hair and you were wearing a black Sabbath shirt? And I told you the story a couple weeks ago, how Tammy and Tammy in my freshman year, the two Tammies, remember them? Remember those girls? That walked up to me every single lunch period and just said, hey, Rick, we're praying for you. God has a plan for your life. Remember those two girls, Rick? Remember how sweet and great they were? They didn't come accusing you, rebuking you, saying you were going to hell. They literally brought promise into your life, and they prayed for you. Who are you now to think that you've gotten so good that now you can point at the guy with the long hair and the black Sabbath t-shirt and kind of scold him? And I went, whoa. Uh, Yeah, I've become a little bit of a Pharisee, haven't I? He goes, yeah. And I say it to you all the time. There's a Pharisee inside of all of us waiting to grow up. He's living in there, and you just got to punch him in the head every time he raises up because it will ruin your walk with God and, your, and the way that you affect other people. So there was something about Jesus that made people want to come to him. And this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain. Yes. He was associating with such um, despicable people. Love it. E- uh, even eating with them. Whoa. So Jesus used this illustration. He says, if, if you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the other 99 to go and search for the one lost until you found it? And then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulders when you arrived. You would call together your friends and neighbors to rejoice because you found the lost sheep. In the same way, heaven will be happier over one lost sinner who returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have stayed, uh, haven't strayed away. Or suppose a woman has 10 valuable silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and, and look in every corner of the house and sweep every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, she'll bring her friends and neighbors uh, to rejoice with her because she has found her lost coin. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of the angels when one person re- returns. Listen, I've said this to you before. God, Jesus uh, sees people like sheep. And there's a scripture that I love in the Bible. It sounds so poetic. We are the sheep of his pasture. Don't you love that? Until you realize that sheep are the dumbest animals on the planet. (laughs) If one sheep runs off the cliff, 400 will follow it. They get lost like this. They're not bright animals. And the Lord was saying to us in a very poetic way, you're not that bright. You need a shepherd because you ain't, you, yeah, you're kind of, you're a little dense. So Jesus, he sees people as lost sheep that need a shepherd. They've been lost by carelessness and wandering away. And Jesus looks at them and goes, I value these people. I love them. Start looking at people differently. See them as the way the, way the Lord does as lost sheep. And then he talks about the coin. Have you ever lost money? Come on. I'm not talking about the stock market. One time I put a $100 bill in my, somewhere in the closet because I didn't want to lose it because we were going to use it in three weeks. Remember, you know that day when you're, you know, and you're like, okay, I'm going to stash this away. This is a good thing. And then I forgot where I put it. You ever done that? Oh, man. So my closet, I literally have everything torn out of my closet. And I finally find it. And I go, why did I put it there? Because I thought no one would find it. <laughs> well, I didn't find it. You know, it took me forever. It's funny about coins, if you ever watch Pawn Stars. How many of you watch that? Great show, you learn a lot. Some guy brings in this old, nasty coin. Hey, I got this coin here. And I'm like, big deal. It's all beat up. And they bring in the expert, and the expert brings out the little thing. And, oh, oh, huh. Well, you got quite a coin here. It's worth $40,000. And I go, I want a coin. <laughs> Where did I get one of those coins? You know why? Money has value even at when it's lost because it still has value. Lost money doesn't mean it loses its value. If I find a $5 bill in my son's bottom of his hamper that's got junk all over it because I don't know where he's been or that $5 bill has been, I don't throw the $5 bill away because I open it up and go, ah, there's the image of one of our presidents, right? Right? Or one of the guys that signed the declaration. 
And I go, this still has value. Jesus looks at people and says, my image is printed on them because we were made in the image of God. Every person was made in the image of God. So because that stamp is on every human being, he finds value in them even when they're completely lost and completely broken and have no way out. Jesus sees them as having value. So when we're in San Francisco or we're in the mall and we see a kid that kind of scares us a little bit and we judge the book by the cover... We need to understand something. They may very well be a Christian, and that's just the way they like to dress. Oh, what? <laughs> Some of us Christians were like, no, 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 the suit for church is you got to have the little sweater with the little t-shirt, and you got to stand like this. And, you know, you, we have this way about us. Instead of saying, that guy right there, I've talked to kids that I go up to witness to, and they're like, man, we're going to the prayer room. We love Jesus. I'm like, awesome. God, forgive me, because I judge them. Listen. There are people that are lost and broken that we need to look at as being imprinted in the image of God and still has value before the Lord. Even the guy that strung out, Aaron said he was talking to this guy. This guy walked up to him in the streets of San Francisco and said, I was a devil worshiper, and I, this angel over there by the light pole came, and, I, you know, and Aaron was kind of freaked out by it. And I said, it's amazing. Jesus loves that guy completely, 110%. He's not scared by his darkness. He loves him. And we're supposed to do the same thing, you guys. We're called to do the same thing. Let's close with this verse real quick. I want you to hear this. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. This is a powerful statement that Jesus makes. And whenever I see it in red and Jesus said it, here's what I think about. I better start listening. Because the Son of God knows what he's talking about. Amen? Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And Jesus, the king, will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus made an incredible statement. He said, If you give someone a cup of cold water in my name, your great is your reward in heaven. I read that, and I said... That can't be true. Are you telling me, Lord, if I give somebody a cup of cold water in your name, you actually write that down and there's going to be reward in heaven over that? You know why the Lord said that? Because he wanted us to understand that it doesn't have to be the big kaboom firework thing that we do. It's the everyday little things that we do for people. And Jesus said it. He said, and by the way, uh, if you read on in that chapter, he talks to the people that never went to the poor and never went to the sick and never went to the stranger or the prisoner. And Jesus says, uh, get out of here. You have no part in me. And listen, I want to be a church that prays, and we are. I want to be a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, and we do. But I've seen churches that are all about the gifts of the Spirit and wahoo, everybody comes and has a great time and there's power and there's gifts and everybody goes, wow. And then nobody goes out and does anything for the Lord and nobody goes out and touches the poor. And Jesus, even people will come to him someday and say, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons? And the Lord will say, yeah, but when I was sick, you didn't come. So the church can get enamored by all the spiritual things and not do the practical things and walk in the love of God. And listen to me, that's not Christianity. Christianity is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit like Jesus did and doing the practical things that help people and love people. That's what the church is called to. And I'm going to tell you right now, our church is going to reach people. I told Cliff, we had dinner together on Friday night, me and uh, Mary and Cliff and Cindy. And I said to Cliff, I said, Cliff, my goal, so at some point in my ministry at this church, my goal is to give away a million dollars a year. Not to, not to have 2,000 people in the church and five, six million dollars in tithe coming in and all we do is make Disneyland better for you. 
but we actually take a million dollars a year. Heck, I'd give away 10 if the Lord allows us to have that much money to run our budget and run our church and give it away to ministries that are helping the poor and preaching the gospel and helping people. Because listen, the church has become, in 20 years, our culture has, it's just been horrible. It's actually, oh, how cool is the church, man? And there's pastors, God bless them, man. I, I'm not trying to put them down, but they think their job is to make God cool to culture. And I'm going, God's not insecure like you, bud. He's not in heaven going, oh, man, that guy's really cool. He's going to make me look good. Are you kidding me? The Lord's going, I want to touch people's lives and change them. And then all we do is we build these grand places for people to come in and be comfortable and grade the preaching and grade the worship and grade the church. Like everybody has their little paddle like on Dancing with the Stars. Oh, great sermon, 10. Oh, Pastor Rick wasn't that good today, four. <laughs> Guest speaker didn't like him. <laughs> worship wasn't as good as it was last week. I give it a five. That's what we've become. We've become churches that are filled with how do we grade the preacher? And then we have guys that are building churches based on that. And so all they got to do is slick, cool, nice. And everybody comes and goes, wow. And listen, I'm not saying it doesn't work and people aren't impacted. I'm saying that we are on the wrong footing, I believe, whenever we do that. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and power. And he went out doing good and changed the world. And you and our, and we don't have to be freaky. Look right here. We don't got to be freaks. Some people make this, woo, it's all spiritual and woo, and it's freaky and scary. And, you know, they do weird things. And, and, and then people go, I don't want anything to do with church, man. I'm talking about just loving God honestly and being after his heart and being a church that says, I'm packing the good news of Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell the world. And by the way, I'm going to do what I can to make this world. I'm going to overcome evil with good. And today, you know what good is? Today is this. When you leave this place, go sign the petition. Some of you go, well, I don't want to sign the petition because then we're saying that that young man that's confused about his sexuality, we don't love him. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that there's a better way to help people that are confused in the love of God. But let's not confuse everybody and create problems, yeah? It's okay. It's not political correctness, guys. Jesus isn't in heaven trying to be politically correct right now. He's actually trying to win the lost and love people. And we just need to do it. As East Bay, Forest, listen, if this isn't the kind of church you wanna be in, I'll help you find a church. I will. If you say, you know what, Pastor, your vision just kind of is weird, creeps me out a little bit. I, I'm just not flowing with it. I'll help you find a church. We'll pray, we'll fast, we'll seek the Lord, and we'll get you in a place where you can grow in the love of God. But if you're going to come to church here, we're going to be about pursuing God. We're going to be about helping you do the ministry. Listen, Karen O'Brien on our staff, wonderful lady, she's on fire right now with this equipping part of the church. Because most churches are, here's our vision, you guys come serve it. Our job, the Bible says, is that pastors are to equip the saints to go out and do ministry. So yeah, we have vision that you're going to help us with, but our vision is to help you fulfill your vision. That's our vision, to help you become all that Jesus wants you to become. And I love it. We're, we're not interested in you helping me build my kingdom. Pooey. I know great men of God who have great ministries, and I'm, I'm not kidding. All they're building is a corporation. It's just a corporate thing. And I go, bro, like, I'll give my life for the kingdom, but not to build your corporation, man, and to build your, so you can pat yourself on the back that you're such a wonderful guy and a great preacher or whatever. And like, I, listen, I love every church. I pray for every church, even the ones I look at and go, eh, you know what? It's a little tantalizing. They're just trying to get people to come. I pray for them, and I bless them because they're preaching the gospel. But I'm saying here at this church, we're going for it, giddy up all the way, we're not messing around. And I said it when I took over the church. We're not backing down. We're going for it. Amen? All right. I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. Some of my pastor friends will hear that sermon and try to correct me. It's okay. We got to love people. Today, Commit to $35, guys, $35 a month. 
Look right here. What is that, three coffees? I don't drink coffee, but I'm always amazed when I go to the Starbucks and people order their coffee. And it's like, $17.50. I'm like, what? For a coffee? What's in your coffee? 35 bucks a month, honestly, for all of us is pretty doable. Unless you're just in dire straits financially. And our $35 a month can go to medicine, can go to that child, can go to help somebody that we don't even know. And one day, I'm convinced of this, we'll go and stand before the Lord, and when we're in heaven, someone will walk up to us and say, thank you. And we like, for what? Because you gave $35 a month. We never met, but I got to find Jesus. By the way, we, we put some kids through college from Otenawa. A nurse, a lawyer, uh, help me, and a teacher. They're all going to college. Kids that were orphans on the street, doomed to failure, are now going to be lawyers and doctors. Touching the world, yeah? Amen. All right. Let's pray, because I'll keep going. I, f- I feel good about it. I want to just, uh, with everyone's eyes closed for just a minute, pretty intense message, really. It's it should shake us to the core and it should excite us that we actually have the ability when we partner with Jesus to change the world and to change people's lives. And I just want to give anyone in this room the chance to know Jesus, this wonderful Jesus that I just talked about who loves people, who loves the lost, who loves the sick, who loves the oppressed, he loves the sinner, he loves everyone. Regardless of what you've done, he invites you to come as you are that he could clean up your life and give you a hope and a future. And I just want you, if that's you, say, I want to know Jesus today. I just want you to raise your hand up so I can see it. Would you just, and I just want to acknowledge you. I'm not going to make you stand up and do a lap or anything. But just you say, I want to know Jesus today. I'm starting way out on the right here, and I'm coming across on your right. If that's you, say, I need Jesus in my life today. I need to be saved. I'm coming through. I'm in the middle. I'm coming through all the way over now to the left. If you just say, I need the Lord in my life. Awesome. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. What a privilege to live in such a great country. What a privilege, Lord, to to be able to be a resource to a dying and broken world. Lord, I'm asking right now that you would help East Bay Foursquare Church to be a Jesus-loving, walking church that isn't just concerned about how well the service went or didn't go, but we're more concerned about the lost people that don't know you And we're more concerned, God, with how we're actually loving you and loving others. Make that the mark of this place. Make us a spiritual place, Lord, where we pray and we worship like no other place. Where we walk in the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God is here and the sick are made well. But Lord, also help us to be practical and loving. Lord, I'm reminded of Mercy Ministries that just kicked off 30-some people to go love on sick people to help those in the hospital and those who are afflicted. Lord, what a privilege. Thank you. It's an honor that we get to see that happen right here through this house. And Lord, I believe you put this church here and you put these people here to be a resource for the kingdom. That's what's your plan. And I pray that we would do it and we would be faithful before you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna worship the Lord on your way out. Please don't forget to sign that thing. We're going to worship the Lord for the next, look at right here, five minutes. And I know you're going, hey, man, the Baptists are going to beat us to the restaurant. No, they're not. We're going to, this is weird. We're going to worship the Lord and just pour out love upon Jesus right now. Stand to your feet, would you? And on your way out, please take a form. Cliff and Mary will be out there to talk to you about the, the children.